Greetings fellow vintage ampaholics. Today's feature amp is the Magnetone Melodier Deluxe Model 109 from 1955. This amp is fairly famous not for something it has, but something it doesn't have. So if you're curious at all, stay tuned and we'll take a look at the circuit and figure out what makes the Magnetone Melodier so unusual. First off, externally, there's nothing particularly remarkable. As you can see, there are two 8-inch speakers uh, oriented diagonally so that the cabinet could be as narrow as possible. And we have the Magnetone uh, trademark. On top, it had no handle when I bought it, so I bought a replacement handle here from Antique Electronic Supply in Tempe. There's two types of handles they sell. There's one that's completely flat, with stitching and then there's the raised what they call the raised handle the raised is a hundred times better than the flat one the flat one is really dry rough leather that actually is unpleasant to pick up and carry it has sharp edges I think personally very cheaply made this one for about the same price has got this raised area here it's soft and supple and out of focus and nicely stitched so I installed this one proudly and I'm glad I did. We look here, we have sort of a, I don't know, honey brown type leatherette covering, which is in pretty good shape. Here we have the rear of the amplifier. Nothing really out of the ordinary back here. Uh, the control panel has the dedicated microphone input with its own microphone volume. We have two instrument inputs of equal impedance and gain. Master volume control that controls not only the instruments, but also the volume of the microphone after you've fine-tuned it with its dedicated volume control. Uh, we have the tone control where it's just the single bass treble balance. Nice bright pilot light, fuse holder, on-off toggle. This panel course is going to protect the tubes and give the speakers something to resonate against. I'm going to remove it in just a second so you can see inside. And then we take a look at the bottom open compartment here where the cord is stored. I think uh, one shortcoming of their design is they should have had a little lip along the bottom. Because every time I carry this amplifier, uh, it rocks around a little bit and the cord works its way out and then it falls on the ground and then I trip over it. Um, and curse and uh, all of this is sort of a needless inconvenience if they just put a little lipple on the bottom. So I'm going to go complain to Magnetone, okay? But meanwhile, let's take the back off of this and see what's inside. Here we are with the back off the cabinet, which appears to be made of about one half inch plywood, not particle board, thank heavens. We look at the amp suspended in the ceiling. We got the shielded 12AX7 preamp tube, uh, big can uh, multi value uh, filter capacitor, uh, two 6V6 output tubes in push pull, 5Y3 rectifier, fairly conservatively sized power transformer, and it does get a little warm after you played this for a while. And then nestled in the back here is a fairly small output transformer. Of interest are the two identical 8-inch speakers. Uh, the speaker code, uh, the beginning here is 395, which you will probably not find on most uh, speaker uh, code charts, but that's for Cletron, uh, which is Cleveland Electronics Company. Um, add that then to your list. Okay, it wasn't on mine. I had to do some research. The way I found out what that means is this is these are the same speakers that are used in the 1954 and 1955 Champ uh, amplifiers uh, for like the 5E1 chassis. Uh, so uh, and they have Cletron uh, stickers on them. So with the 395 on the speaker and the Cletron sticker, uh, you can put two and two together. Made in the 31st week of 1955, which would make sense with the 1955 amp, which is about when I think this one was made. 
Okay, the other thing that's uh, kind of neat is the original schematic on the side with the oh so important underwriter uh, laboratory seal of approval at the bottom. No right minded individual would ever own an amp that didn't have that UL sticker on it. Now you're probably saying, well, that's all fine and dandy, but what's so unusual about this thing? Well, let's take a look at the schematic. Okay, here we are looking at the schematic of the Magnetone Melodier amplifier. Microphone input with its dedicated volume control. Two instrument inputs. All three going through 100K resistors on their way to the grid of the 12AX7. Signal leaves the plate. Comes up here to the tone and volume control and back into the grid on the other side of the 12AX7. Signal leaves the plate comes up here through a 0.02 uh, coupling capacitor and goes into the grid of the 6V6. So far, very routine. But then the question arises, due to the absence of any sort of phase inverter out here or a driving transformer or even a centered tapped uh, choke coil, what provides the phase inversion between the upper 6V6 and the lower? Well, uh, in all honesty, I am not well enough versed in higher level electronic theory to explain every nuance of this to you, but I can show you how it happens. First off, notice we have our normal screen voltage coming in here to the screen of the lower 6V6 to the screen of the upper 6V6. All very standard. This isn't though. Notice this connection right here in which a the uh, screen of the upper 6v6 goes through a 0.02 uh, capacitor into the grid of the lower 6v6. This is very unusual. Not only that, the grid of the lower 6v6 also has a parallel 0.01 microfarad capacitor and 470k resistor connected to it, which this type of circuit is normally associated with a cathode, with biasing of a cathode. So, with the combination of this screen to grid connection and this strange cathode biasing network at the side, uh, we have the phase inverter for this circuit. And so, in effect, the two 6V6 output tubes provide their own phase inversion. Now, I've heard this called a self-split circuit. It's my understanding that it was invented in the 1940s by engineers at Philco Radio. At that time, uh, their reasons for doing this are probably to economize on production costs. Uh, that period of time before and after World War II was a period where people were a little short of money. And if you wanted to stay in business, you had to find a way to keep your products affordable. I think it's probably why Magnetone seized upon this as a method to leave out some expensive parts uh, and theref therefore make an amplifier that works just fine, but is less expensive to create. Now you're probably asking yourself, due to this peculiar circuitry and the phase inversion, portion of this amplifier, does it have an unusual or characteristic sound that results from that? And my answer to you would be yes and no. Okay, yes in that when you do spectral analysis of this amp, and it has been done, the harmonic spectrum is different from any amplifier that I have ever seen. I will uh, put a link in the description of this video that will lead you to the spectral analysis of this amp. It's posted on YouTube. I think you'll find it to be very unusual. Now, as far as the no part, uh, to the ear, um, I don't notice anything really uh, unusual about this. It sounds like a nice old 1955 vintage amplifier to me. I will say this, that the volume is not huge. The output power, I think, is down from what you might expect on a pair of 6V6s and push-pull. Uh, if there is any price paid for the elimination of the phase inverter, 
of a actual device to do phase inversion, I think you lose a little output power. Whereas normally you might expect, what, like 14 watts. On this, you probably get closer to 10 or 12. So you just turn it up a little bit higher and you get some really nice, clean, vintage tone. Okay, I got the magnetone plugged in and ready to go. First, I'm going to play something at a moderate volume. This amp doesn't really come into its own until you start pushing it a little. So this will not be pushing it. This is just like 12 o'clock uh, on the volume scale, maybe a 5 out of 10. Now let's crank it up to like seven or seven and a half and you're going to start to hear that little bit of that ragged type of sound that these amps are so good at and that really gives you the tone that the solid state stuff just can't match. Okay, see what you think. Well, that's it on the demo. I'm keeping it short today. It's about 105 degrees here in the shop. It's miserable. Um, I hope that you enjoyed what you saw and that you found that phase inverter circuit to be rather interesting. It is really unusual. Um, and that you'll stay tuned in the future for more similar videos featuring vintage amps and old jukeboxes and other crazy stuff that I invent out here in this sweltering workshop. Okay, I appreciate your time and interest. Please stay tuned. I hope to see you again in the near future. Bye for now.